Good morning, everyone. My name is Dave Bennett, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors for the Ottawa Branch. On behalf of the Ottawa Branch, I am pleased to welcome you to today's webinar from the University of Ottawa titled Hot Topic, Lessons from the Deadliest Extreme Heat Event in Canadian History. We welcome our presenters, Emily Tetzlaff and Dr. Glenn Kenny. Emily is the PhD candidate at the Human an environmental physiology research unit at the University of Ottawa, which is directed by Dr. Kenny. And Dr. Kenny is a full professor of physiology at the University of Ottawa. Dr. Kennedy has already presented a few webinars with the Ottawa branch in the past, and we are certainly glad to have him back with us. Although the webinar will be presented in English, <clears throat> well, please, uh, if you wish, uh, bilingual participation is certainly encouraged. I wanna give you a special welcome to anyone here who is not yet a member of the association. We hope these webinars will inspire you to join us. And to our members, we hope these, we, well, sorry, we hope that these webinars will encourage you to maintain your membership and to encourage your friends to join us. Remember that you can give the gift of membership. To learn more about giving the gift of membership, please click the link in the chat box to access the National Association website. There will be a question and answer period at the end of the webinar. Please type your questions in the chat box throughout the session and our presenters will answer them during the Q&A. Now I am going to turn the presentation over to our presenters. Thank you, Dr. Kenny. All right, good morning. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dave, for the introduction and uh, thank you everybody for joining on this nice cold day. Hopefully you can see me. Um, the presentation, uh, the main presentation will be given by Emily. I do want to give you, first of all, a little bit of a background and, and also take this opportunity to thank many of the members and uh, certainly bonjour à tout le monde. Um, thanks for, for joining today. I think this is an important presentation for a number of reasons. Um, what we forget about is that as, as Canadians, we always feel that we are living in relatively temperate climates, but as we saw from the from the Western Heat Dome of 2021. Uh, so this is late June, early July of 2021, when 619 uh, heat vulnerable older adults uh, lost their lives during this heat event. We saw also the strain that it created within our healthcare system. There was certainly, we had COVID-19, we had forest fires out West. All this created a huge strain on the first responders. And ultimately what that does is it trickles down to you and I, especially the most vulnerable who may need uh, support and services, especially during an extreme heat event. So one of the things that we've been doing over the years, thanks to your great team, thanks to your members, you and others, uh, you've been participating in the work over the last number of years. And through COVID-19, you guys were critical in the development of the heat mitigation strategies that we are now using, that we are now implementing. For example, already, as, as a member of the World Health Organization, we are essentially developing currently uh, informed decisions about the indoor temperature limits, how that might mitigate the risks to health and safety of those individuals who may be the most vulnerable and ex exposed to extreme heat, who don't necessarily have the means to protect themselves. And what I mean by that is you may have people, low-income people or individuals that simply just don't have a, a home with accessible air conditioning in a way in which to access perhaps cooling centers. So the work that we've been doing is really trying to drive solutions to help uh, individuals protect themselves. And whether that's the use of air conditioning, whether that's use of uh, cooling centers, is giving the government advice on what they can do. What are alternative strategies for, for those individuals that don't have access? So already the results of the work that we've done over the last few years is playing a critical role in uh, changing how we go about protecting the most vulnerable. And I think for many of you right now, as you're sitting in your home uh, after the snowstorm, you're saying, why the hell are we talking about heat at this, at this stage? Well, you know what, it's important. It's important because right now is a time for us to prepare for the summertime. It seems rather premature, but already you can be taking steps and we'll talk about that towards the end of the presentation, steps that can help protect you and also protect your neighbors. And if you're well informed on how to manage that, you can take a, a, a lead in providing guidance to, your, to your, your friends, your family members who may be at greater risk. So hopefully today what you're going to see is 
uh, a bit of a unique perspective on the challenges that Canadians faced uh, in, in, with this extreme heat event. But the good news, like I said, at the end of the day is we have the solutions, we're generating the solutions, and our work continues today in looking at how we can develop heat mitigation. So without any further delay, and certainly I'll come back towards the end and look at how we identify heat stress and what mitigation strategies you can do and what our research entails today, I'll let Emily take it over from here. So thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Okay, great. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thanks for taking your time away from shoveling this morning to join us. Um, so I'm just going to start by kind of continuing off the foundation that Dr. Kenny has just laid out there for us about the work that we're doing at HEPRU with your support. Um, and I wanted to start by briefly touching on what extreme heat events are. We also refer to them as heat waves. And in this presentation, you're going to hear me use the term heat dome as well. Um, and really what these events are is they're multi-day weather systems that come through for weeks or days or weeks, um, and they create a big giant pot lid over a specific geographic area. And because of that stagnated air, because of atmospheric pressure, the heat begins to build up within it. And this is exactly what happened in late June in Western Canada. So predominantly British Columbia, but Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, the Yukon and our Northwest Territories as well, really felt the brunt of this extreme unprecedented heat dome event. So we really saw the temperatures starting to rise in the in the west around the 24th of June. They peaked between the 28th and the 29th before they kind of began to dissipate around July the 4th. And that's actually when our heat event was declared over. So in Canada, currently, the environment and climate change um, division within our federal government is who releases these weather alerts. And so it lasted about 10 days in length. But within that 10 day period, they had 103 all time records um, for, for temperatures. We had the highest recorded temperature in Canadian history at 49.6 degrees. And we saw a ton of fatalities that were occurring following basically the same trajectory as the heat. Right beginning on the 24th, we started to have heat related deaths reported to the coroner. They peaked, um, as the graph is showing you on the screen here, they peaked uh, along with the 28th and 29th when the heat rose. But what's really interesting to see is that the deaths continued after the heat event was declared over. And that's because we've got carryover effects that happen from heat. We've got slow rates of recovery and heat dissipation that happen within people's homes. And so up until past July the 12th, we were continuing to see that, that death toll rise. So because of how extreme this event was, the BC coroner's group uh, ended up convening a panel to review it. This was just released in the spring of 2022. And I've highlighted on the screen a few of the really key findings that I thought were critical to share. So first off, 98% of the deaths that happened during the heat dome were inside of a house and private residencies were the majority of them. 67% of the decedents were over the age of 70. Nobody under the age of 40 um, passed away during the event. More than half of all the decedents lived alone and they lived in socially or, mar or materially deprived neighborhoods. And almost all were living or residing in homes that didn't have adequate air conditioning or cooling systems. So fans or, or built-in air units or window units. So, to help ensure that we can learn as much as we can from, from this tragic, this historic event, uh, we at the Human and Environmental Physiology Research Unit are building on the partnership that we already had with the Climate Change and Innovation Bureau at Health Canada uh, to really investigate all of the impacts of the heat dome and make sure that we're helping to actually translate this research into action and build Canada's heat resilience for future heat events that are likely to occur with climate change. So our projects kind of fall within three main categories in this train in this train of thought here. And so I'm going to share primarily about the media analysis that we've been running for the past year with them today. So we've got um, seven different projects that we've been able to tackle over the last little while. We also have a cross Canada questionnaire that I'm going to share some early findings of. And many of you that might uh, be kind of a, a familiar um, part of the research program because the National Association helped circulate that last summer for us. And then we also have a couple of heat wave simulations um, and cooling strategy trials that are underway right now, which Dr. Kenny will talk about some of the recruitment that we're doing for that right now, closer to the end of the presentation. But starting in with the media, diving into this beast. So 
as those temperatures rose between the 24th to the 28th, and then over time, we basically saw just a steady stream of new news coverage coming with the event because it was his, so historic. Um, of course, it was beating temperature records and it was gaining a lot of press. And this came through traditional newspapers, e-newspapers, radio and TV um, transcripts, community level blog posts, um, government press releases, municipal notices, um, tons of different and diverse types of content. And this type of coverage not only happened during the heat event, but continued for up to an, an excess of six months after the heat event. So we really saw this as a really rich opportunity because, of course, peer review academic work had not yet been done in this event because it was so um, recent. We really saw that the media was going to be a great data set for us to dive into and, and really learn about how in Canada we communicate about extreme heat. So we set up a really cool uh, qualitative methodology for this and looked at all the publicly, publicly available uh, articles that we could get our hands on that were published between June 2021 and February 2022. And we ended up with nearly 3,000 unique articles. So every article just published once. Of course, it gets published multiple times over. So that number was in excess of 5,000. But just looking at those unique articles. And we really wanted to know First off, the who, what, where, when, how, and why of heat communication. So those kind of basic journalistic principles of, of what we know to be within an article. But we wanted to know who are the spokespeople during a heat event? Who does the media turn to as an expert when they want to communicate this risk or when they want to communicate um, the meteorological implications or the environmental implications? So who are they turning to as experts to, to source? We also want to know who the audience is. Is there certain populations that we're gearing our, our media to? Are we primarily warning older adults? Are we primarily uh, warning people who are experiencing homelessness? Who are we communicating to? We also want to know what information is being disseminated. Are we sticking to the content that's on the record-breaking kind of numbers and just talking about it um, kind of from a fanfare perspective? Or are we actually using this media to communicate um, heat mitigating behaviors? Are we telling people how to access cooling centers and how to cool yourself within your home? We want to know where we're circulating this coverage. So are we just circulating it within the Western provinces? Did coverage reach all the way to the East Coast um, so that we get kind of that geographic reach? We wanted to know when as well we were publishing this. And that's the graph I have on there um, on the screen for you. And you'd see that it looks very similar to the graph that I showed you of, of the death toll um, and of the how the heat traveled as well. So we had over 748 articles published on June 28th alone, which was the peak of the heat. And this was really interesting to us because we wanted to know how much preventative or proactive news coverage did we have that helped warn the populations in the West of this in, impending heat dome. Um, but what we can see is there's a quite a bit of reactive content that's happening over the course of time after where then it's looking in hindsight and reflecting on what happened rather than giving those warnings via the traditional media. And lastly, we just wanted to know why and how are we sharing this information? So are we um, sharing it via what different strategies? And then are we communicating why it's important to talk about it? Why is it important to prevent um, this risk for yourself? And like Dr. Kenny said, and we're going to reflect on a little bit on a, a couple slides later, but the demand that's placed onto our medical system during a heat event like this is critical. So are we communicating why we need to be proactive um, and engage in care for ourselves so that we're not adding to that demand as well? And so really, ultimately, what this first investigation showed us is that there are a ton of opportunities for our public health authorities um, to improve our communication responsiveness during heat, extreme heat events, um, talking about timing, talking about the content of the messaging, how we can better inform our journalists and educate the public on heat protective behaviors. So we're now working with Health Canada to work on that knowledge to action piece and creating some um, methods to communicate that to the media. The second question that we wanted to investigate was all of the imagery that came with those news articles. So you know that a catchy newspaper is going to have a big flashy photo on the front of it. It's going to draw you in. But that message itself is also communicating some kind of message or content to you. So up in the top right corner here, I have did a little snippet. So it says the title of this article was 70% of sudden deaths recorded by BC heat wave were due to extreme temperatures, coroner confirms. We would see titles like that matched up with an image like the one on the left of the beachgoers. So we had a big 
difference between what our image was conveying to us, which was kind of fun in the sun, hot weather, let's get outside versus the message of, of the actual content body telling us that this was a deadly, this was a fatal heat event. This was causing heat related illnesses. This was causing hospitalizations and really conveying the deadly risk that the heat posed. Um, so this was a critical finding as well, because having such a significant divergence between those two messaging leads to a really significant um, conveyance of, of misinformation to the public. So we set up a really neat methodology where we looked at the specific content of every single photo that was published in these articles. So we had over a thousand images from those three, nearly 3000 articles. And we looked at what age group of people are in the image? Where are they? Are they inside? Are they outside? Are they engaging in a heat um, protective behavior? So in a second image here, we have someone wetting their skin. So they're outside, but they're trying to do something that's going to help cool themselves. And then we also looked at how often we were using images of cascading weather events or events taking place. So something like forest fires that we know come often with heat waves. Um, but we wanted to know, are we using and relying on those images versus actually just showing that heat itself can be fatal? So we know it's quite an invisible threat, um, but what we found here is that there's a great opportunity for us to, again, work with journalists and media producers to ch change the narrative of the images. And so we're working with Health Canada now to develop that guidance. So like Dr. Kenny said we, as well, we have, of course, we had a divergence of crises that were underway at the time of the heat dome. So COVID-19 was still an active crisis in the in the West um, at this point in time. And the biggest concern that we saw here with how it was communicated in the media is that there was a lot of uh, conflicting advice. Half of the articles were saying heat is the deadliest risk. You can forego wearing your mask if you need to due to being able to manage your, your body's heat. Um, acts as a cooling center no matter what, things like that. And contra to that, we were seeing COVID-19 uh, guidance remains the priority. You can't enter a cooling center if you don't have a mask on or if you're unvaccinated. So we had a, two different messages going out to the public, some posing one as the greater threat, some posing the other. And because of that, we know that when information gets confusing, it becomes something that you want to trust less. And what we found here is that this is a priority for the future. We know that maybe not the specific circumstance of the 2021 heat dome and COVID-19 pandemic, but there's going to be future heat events. There's going to be future viral outbreaks. So we need to understand how we're communicating those messages in a way that remains clear and concise, and then we can support our public better. The second crisis that was going on in the West and is ongoing to this day was the opioid overdose crisis. So we know that when we mix drug use and heat, we are basically creating a, a very lethal combination for a couple of different reasons. Um, and from the from the media articles, this was this received a decent amount of coverage as well. And so we wanted to explore it further. Um, and what we found was kind of four main themes that I've highlighted through some quick little quotes there. But the first one was the actual communication of the fact that there's an added risk here. So if we're using something like an opioid, we're going to have um, a sed like a sedative effect on our body. We could go unconscious. If we go unconscious outside, then we're at an even greater risk of not being able to manage our heat. So we saw some content related to that. We also saw some coverage on how there's a ton of life-saving medications like naloxone that are used for opioid um, overdose reversal that cannot be stored in cars or outdoors. Um, otherwise, they're going to become unstable and unable to help us uh, in those emergency conditions. We also saw some coverage that had to do with people that use drugs themselves, uh, communicating that they felt that there was some stigma around using community access cooling centers. And so that was a critical concern that we need to address as well moving forward to make sure that all members of the public feel comfortable accessing these community resources. And the last one that reiterates the point that Dr. Kenny posed is that mixing the COVID-19 pandemic, mixing the opioid overdose crisis with the heat dome and, and the number of uh, heat-related emergency calls that were taking place, we placed a massive toll on our pre-hospital care system and our hospital care system. So we had uh, paramedics and uh, 
uh, firefighters and police that were having to handle all of this under heat conditions themselves. And it placed a, a massive both physical and mental toll on the system. So again, just reiterating that the, the knowledge to action piece here is that we need to continue to work um, with our public health agencies and our federal government to look at how we're addressing the coinciding of multiple crises at once. So kind of be moving a little bit beyond just the, the health impacts of this, I've put up a kind of a, a crazy little map here, but to, to show how crazy the divergence is here, when a heat event happens, of course, we have these human health effects, but we've got just this massive range of other cascading um, impacts that happen as well. So to our environment, both our natural resources, our natural systems, to our animals, um, to the government, to our private sector businesses and owners, to our systems of social infrastructure, so our community care, um, and then our critical infrastructure. So I've got some images up there of sidewalks that buckled from the heat and park benches that fully melted. There was water crises in multiple communities where there was going to be shortages. Um, things like waste management got canceled during this heat event to protect the workers. And these cascading implications lasted weeks, if not months, and are still in some communities being felt, um, thinking immediately to the agricultural uh, workers, so farmers that lost entire crops during this heat event that are still going to be recovering from the economic implications of that. So what this study really showcased to us was how far reaching those impacts are um, for days, weeks, months post event and, and what we need to do to better intervene and support these different areas of the different sectors. Now, the last two investigations that we focused on were this idea of working under the heat dome. So just like I mentioned for the farmers there, there was a ton of implications for worker health and safety here as well. And immediately we tend to think of those implications to our outdoor workers. So our construction workers, our agriculture, our electrical utilities. But we actually saw that there was over 40 different classifications of workers that were impacted by the heat, both indoor and outdoor. So we also had people like kitchen staff. So I have a quote up there that many of our union members are working in temperature conditions, which may be harmful to them. We've heard that in several kitchens, our members are working in nearly 40 degree temperatures. Um, we also saw teachers, because at this time of the year um, in British Columbia, not all classes were out for the summer yet, working in classrooms that had no air conditioning. So they canceled students and, and sent them all home because the buses also didn't have air conditioning, but the teachers were still expected to come in and were therefore being placed in a, in a high risk environment. And then we had individuals, so there was a massive uptick in people wanting to buy uh, air conditioning units or realizing their air conditioning unit wasn't working. So we had our service repairmen out, when it, men and women out, um, trying to engage in safe work and, and help people be able to manage heat themselves in their homes. Um, but of course, then that placed a risk on them and working in um, conditions that were in excess of safe limits. We also saw articles that were communicating how significant uh, work modifications needed to be made. So workers going in at three and four in the morning to try and get a little bit of relief from the heat. Um, but knowing that during the Western heat dome, like other heat waves, one of the conditions of a heat alert being placed is that we're also getting um, elevated nighttime temperatures as well. So the relief was pretty, pretty minimal um, for that. So what this really emphasized to us, th these key findings is that we need to help our health and safety agencies as well as our public health agencies look at communicating heat specific guidance and across Canada, this is regulated provincially. Um, and in many cases, it's just provided as general guidance. There's not a lot of specific regulation or um, legislation that relates to it. So we really need to look at how with climate change and future heat events like this, this is going to be a, a critical risk to workers across the country. And then I just wanted to touch again, we also did a specific investigation into those first responders. So putting first responders first when we consider heat waves. Um, so like I reiterated with not only the coinciding crises, but if we even take those aside and we just look at first responders responding in the heat, um, the risk to them is, is so significant. I've highlighted a quote here that I think is really critical that paramedics were breaking down in tears, removing their shirts to cool down and even vomiting from the effects of the heat. Paramedics say these shifts took an emotional toll. They were also physically exhausting. Paramedics were wearing their uniforms as well as plastic gowns on top and other personal protective equipment while entering residences as hot as 45 degrees Celsius to resuscitate people. They were soaked in sweat and some got sick from the heat. So just to, to kind of circle back around that 
we have risk to, to all members of our population, our vulnerable groups in particular, and then our service providers that are trying to care for them um, in these emergency scenarios are also working at their max capacity in, in such risky environments. Um, so we really need to make sure that when we're working with our health agencies from the takeaways of this is that we're emphasizing preventative action to the public um, because as the public heeds that advice, there's going to be less of a demand that's placed on our care system and, and these first responders. So before I hand it back to Dr. Kenny, the last thing I wanted to share is just one little slide um, that's some of the early findings from that Cross Canada questionnaire. So it was called, how do you handle heat? Um, so that might ring a bell for a few of you that hopefully submitted it for us. Uh, we, we got over a thousand responses which from across the country, which was amazing. Um, and it was everything we were asking questions about. Do you perceive a threat from heat? Do you engage in personal strategies for managing heat? What are the, what's your knowledge of the signs and symptoms of it um, among a series of other questions? But a couple of the really interesting findings that I wanted to highlight were that almost all respondents, 80% felt that they were sensitive to the heat and had at some time experienced a heat related illness symptom. However, only 20% of our respondents actually think that their health is at risk during a heat vent. So that was kind of a, a unique distinction of we recognize sensitivity to it, but do I personally think I'm at risk? Maybe not. Oh, and just to say as well, our average age was oh, 67 years. Um, you had to be over the age of 50 to complete the survey. So it was trying to capture older adults. Um, we also asked about how you access information. So the respondents relied on a whole series of different sources for it. So traditional news being being the main and the government as well, um, but also informally, which was interesting to see in community associations as well. Despite that range of, of sourcing of guidance, um, less than half actually felt that they adapt their behavior when they see a release uh, or an alert from these media sources. So they use different sources and they know it's accessible to them here, um, but actual behavioral action, less than half are engaging in it because of it. We also saw that almost all respondents think that they can act in the direction provided against a heat, extreme heat event. So they know that they have the personal strategies and awareness to engage in a behavior. Um, but many also felt that there needs to be greater effort to increase public awareness about these extreme heat events. And then the last one I hit, uh, talked about there was this that respondents feel that um, all levels of government have a degree of responsibility for supporting the public in this but half also feel that there's internal accountability as well so I just thought that these were kind of four I guess eight um, really interesting little findings here and these alone provide a ton of value um, to our federal our provincial and our regional health authorities um, because they can use this information to help kind of critically evaluate how they're disseminating information in, in the different regions um, during a heat event and but also in advance of a heat event so knowing in advance of the summer months coming what can we start to do at late spring um, so that we're allowing for people to pre prepare better in advance um, and then what can we do during an actual heat event to continue to communicate that that risk? And this is the perfect segue back to Dr. Kenny um, as he's going to talk about some of the things that we can do and check in on to, to manage our risk. Awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Emily. And uh, so just to build on that, I think if there's a if there's a message to 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 be learned here is that we're all at risk. And I think one of the I think the the best way to characterize this is that heat is a silent killer across many sort of facets. And one of the most important thing that I've learned over the years, and I've worked with thousands of workers, whether it be in the deep mechanized mines at three kilometers below the earth, where it can be up to 55, 60 degrees Celsius, 80% humidity, or if it's out in Texas, uh, where it's hot and humid down there, working with electrical utility workers, doing pole work, um, line work, linemen, uh, or deep in the mines, in the coal mines in Germany, um, or if it's in the long-term care facilities where uh, I've been there over the summertime here in Ottawa and people forget that essentially our most vulnerable, the, the people who we love are uh, themselves being isolated in uh, long-term care facilities that are overheated. Uh, how many of you are aware that the Ontario government failed to provide adequate air conditioning? They had not met their goals in providing long-term care facilities with the uh, resources they need to keep their most, the most, our most vulnerable safe. When you combine that with COVID-19 and isolations, many of them were under extreme strain or experienced high levels of physiological strain. 
So the bottom line is, is that one of the things that we we can't forget, and, and certainly what you saw from this image is that, you know, sometimes we really downplay the impact that heat has. And you'd be surprised if I told you right now that you can get heat stress in the cold. If you think about it, if you do, if you're shoveling and you're doing enough work and you're fully encapsulated with that, that uh, impermeable protective clothing, there's no question that you still can get a fairly high core temperature that in itself can create a significant strain on your body, on your heart, as it tries hard to increase blood flow to the skin to get rid of that heat. That can create a significant strain that combined with the work that you're doing can overload you and you actually can experience heat stress. It's not inconsistent what we saw with electrical utility workers from Hydro One. Uh, it, was, uh, it was November, it was minus 10 degrees Celsius, the individuals were experiencing while doing work on the towers, the high towers had reached core temperatures just under 40 degrees Celsius. And that's with the wind blowing and it was minus 10 degrees Celsius. Bottom line is there's a lot that we need to do. And I think ultimately what, the, what this assessment revealed to us is that we are potentially going to have to rely on each other or our own families or our loved ones to protect ourselves because again, if you think of what happened during the Western heat dome, healthcare system was under strain. And if we all remember the Minister of Health, if I re recall correctly, uh, she lost her position because of the outcries associated with the way this was handled. The strain was huge. And ultimately we can take actions ourselves by essentially understanding what our risks are. Number one, I think anybody knows that if you have chronic health condition, this really is going to uh, potentially exacerbate your risk of experiencing heat-related injury. And it's not always as simple as measuring core temperature. And I get that some people, and I know my colleagues who are physicians, would argue that there are simple ways in which to identify people who may be at risk of experiencing heat-related uh, illness or fatality. But I assure you that a heat-related death does not always occur at a high core temperature. In fact, many heat-related illnesses, for example, that we see in in, in people like you or I going out in, in exercising can occur on a day where we just think everything is gonna be well, we just go out for uh, an exercise. I've seen a, long, a lot of young athletes, for example, Olympic athletes, they're going out training each and every day and, and training hard. Then they decide one week, I'm just gonna go out and have fun, go for a relax, relaxing run, and they collapse of heat-related injuries. And why? because you have to remember that your body is has to work in unison with all the systems. So if you're fatigued, if you're stressed, if you're experiencing uh, perhaps uh, maybe uh, diabetic related complications, uh, essentially your diet is off, you're, you're just under a severe level of stress, that in itself can reduce your body's ability to protect itself. So what does that mean? If you go, for example, like in our clinical trials that we ran with patients with type two diabetes, they were exercising at the YMCA, nice, cool environment. But many of them that were undergoing their training still experience heat-related illnesses. That could be syncope. That means reduction in blood pressure. Uh, over, they felt overheated. They felt unwell. That, again, you have to remember that when you're doing any kind of physical activity, your body generates heat. We're just so poor. We're inefficient at using the fuels that are, we take in through our diets to convert that to generate energy for muscle contraction. So we waste a lot of that in the form of heat. So always remember that when you're going out there and you're exercising, you're generating heat. So take it out of your mindset that you always have to be in the heat. Now, if I could create this beautiful image for you right now, that if it, if you can get rid of that nice snow and imagine yourself sitting on a beach in some, in some Southern Island, Caribbean Island, with the sun beaming down, that would be nice. But I want you to also remember that you can get heat stress from just being slightly or moderately physically active. So what are things that you wanna be aware of? Number one is that you can't always sense or detect the effects of heat stress. And I know that all too well, having been in hundreds and hundreds of trials, uh, whether it be extreme cold stress or extreme heat stress, I've experienced collapse and I can tell you it's hard to detect. It's easier when you're observing somebody else because you can change, see the change in behavior. So one of the things to note when you are doing remote health checks, if you have an elderly loved one that's perhaps, you know, in long-term care, living on their own, perhaps in, 
in a, in a, and you know that their home is without air conditioning. The one thing that you will know is that essentially their ability to communicate infra information correctly changes as a person gets heat stress. They may be more despondent. They're less aware of their, their surroundings and less aware of their situation. That's a good cue that essentially a person is starting to show signs of heat-related distress. <laughs> one thing as well, excuse me, <laughs> one thing that is, as I said to you, that is possibly the most difficult thing and if you've had children, you know that, you know, maybe you have a child that had fever. So the easy thing to do is measure their temperature. But as I said to you, temperature doesn't always give you a good understanding. If you are at risk, you may have relatively normal temperature, like a temperature of 38.5. So just to give you a sense of what that temperature would be equivalent to, let's just say you go out for a nice little jog. Uh, it's a little warm outside. Your core temperature can easily reach 38.5. 38 when would it reach that during resting in the heat? Well, if you're sitting in the heat, uh, it's really slow for that core temperature to go up. But the problem is it takes that it takes a long time for it to go up, it might be four or five hours. But by then that level of strain is already elevated. Whereas with exercise, temperature goes really quickly and you can detect that difference. So core temperature is not always a good indicator of the level of strain somebody might experience because you're accumulating that. So one thing to be careful of all the time is recognize that essentially the signs and symptoms that you have might come on a bit too late for you to take action. What I mean by that is by the time, and we see that with all that we do in the laboratory here with many of the individuals that from your organization that participate in our lab, when they're sitting in the heat, it's almost like a light switch. By hour six, seven, or eight in the day, suddenly they feel unwell and they've been good through the whole session. They feel great. And then suddenly light switch goes off. And that's normal. That's a behavior that we see or a response that we see with workers. They may suddenly be despondent. They're showing clear signs of stress or near collapse. And that's very common. So at the end of the day, the one thing I always want you to be aware of is understand your surroundings. So if it's warm in your room, so in your home, so what's warm? The problem is, as we get older, me included, what's going to happen is you will not be able to sense the environment the same way. So you're going to feel like it's a little cooler. One thing to think about is that if your room temperature is greater than 26 degrees, your risk of experiencing heat-related injury is going to rise as temperature increases indoors. So if you're sitting in a room that's exposed to these, uh, uh, the westerly, uh, is facing west, uh, westerly, you're probably in the afternoon going to get more heat stress if you don't have air conditioning. The room will heat up. So recognize that maybe you have a thermostat. Use that as a way to gauge it to know that you shouldn't be sitting in there for a very long time. It won't take long before your body temperature gets hot, but have the resources available to you. So one of the things would be to shift to a room that's cooler, avoid that heat stress. And the one thing that's important to me for, for you to understand is that it's hard for you to detect that. And many of you will have uh, significant changes in how you are responding. You'll get irritable, you'll get fatigued, you'll get angry, things that you probably won't recognize sometimes because either you may be alone or it might be something that triggers you and, and, and somebody might see that response. But if you, again, are exposed to heat or it's hot and you're indoors, you don't have air conditioning, you want to shift to a room that has a cooler level or cooler temperature. But again, checks are important. So when we're talking about that, if you do have somebody you know in your family that's vulnerable, phone calls are important. They should be done in the morning and they should be done in the afternoon, especially if you know that there's the night is going to be warm at night. Because one of the things that we know, the heat-related deaths occur over time. So that means there's a lag effect. So day one, day two, day three, you're going to see a progression and they and, the, and you're not going to see too much of a change in the behavior. It's just going to be a, a, like a light switch going off. But there's things that we can do in advance of preparing ourselves for the summer. How many of you actually exercise? We go to the next slide. If, if, if we're looking at exercising, many of you are out there and physically active and that's fantastic. And I encourage you to be physically active from a from just a health perspective, it's it's so important because it gives you, uh, it, it maintains your capacity, your aerobic capacity, which is fundamentally for activities of daily living, you're just going to be more robust, you're going to be 
better. But again, the one thing would be is as you are more active, you generate more heat. But there's ways in which, again, to protect yourselves and, and, and redefine how you're going to uh, set your home up in the event or for others in the event that they may not be as active like you because there's going to be that heat adoption. So what can we do when we're looking at how our home is designed? Well, there's not, we don't want to be investing a lot of money and trying to change, but certainly if you don't have access to, for example, blinds in your home where you have a westerly facing window, you want to put curtains or you want to be able to put uh, uh, shading in there. And it could be just, again, covering out newspaper, what have you. There are people that just don't have the means in which to buy blinds. There are people that just don't have the means to provide air conditioning. So if it is hot in your home, and some people may not want to open their windows, they're afraid of perhaps danger from somebody breaking into their homes. But if you have a multi-level home, it becomes increasingly uh, important that you do that because it gets hotter as you get up into higher levels. So having airflow from one level to another will encourage or move air from one area to another, draw some of that cooler air from the lower section of the home. Those kinds of heat mitigation strategies are important. And as well, there are other approaches that you can take. And, and you can see down on the, on the slide over here, um, you know, you're looking at shower and spraying yourself. Now, let's talk a bit about some of these important things. One of the things that the coroner's report suggested uh, as, as a possible heat mitigation, and I just want to warn you, fans have been advocated for a long time, okay? WHO or the Lancet, major medical journals have been talking about the use of fans, and we all love fans in the summertime. The problem is, folks, fans can make it worse for you. If room temperatures are 35 or the air temperatures 35 or above, fans are in no way effective in preventing rises in core temperature. So we have to be aware of, again, when should uh, a device be used to protect ourselves. So fans are effective, but be aware that they should only be used when air temperature is below 35. When you're going to shower, for example, maybe you want to immerse yourself in a cool bath, always be aware that, again, that there's that risk of you falling. So best to be sitting or just immersing your limb in cool water to try to extract some of that heat. Ultimately, there's different strategies in terms of protecting yourself. Like I said, you can uh, change the way you set up your home. And that, again, comes down to figuring out where can you shut off rooms that are going to be exposed to the westerly facing sun in the afternoon, close the door, isolate that room, go to a cooler, set up a basement, a, a work area in the basement, or even a recliner with a TV downstairs in the basement so that you have that mitigation. Next slide. So at the end of the day, one of the things that we are doing and trying to promote and give us some better understanding, because like I said, I just said to you, one of the things that has been advocated out there and through your help, we are able to show it doesn't work. Fan use is one good example. Widely advocated around the world because essentially what they want us to know is that essentially with fans is that it could possibly protect you. But remember one thing, fans only provide cooling if you are already hot. You have to be sweating. So that means you're already under heat stress. That means you're already at risk. So you want to avoid that. You don't want to get to that level. So the best way in that situation is obviously to cool yourself a bit before, but keep cool all the time. So you don't have to rely upon the fan, or if you're going to use it, you can use it, but use it early on. So we're doing a fan study right now, and we're going to be doing, looking at fans and their effectiveness, not only for people like ourselves that are able to sit upright during the day and relax, but we're also looking at their, at their use as they are presented in long-term care facilities. There are some facilities that only rely upon the use of fans. We know some of the hospitals across Ontario will bring in these big industrial fans to try to cool off some of the sections because there's no air conditioning. The problem with that, folks, again, th these people are, 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 are resting in their beds. The problem is, is how effective are those fans going to be? So we're also looking at it when people are restricted their beds, have mobility issue, or in a hospital setting, long-term care, will those fans be sufficient? The Ontario government has been met or has been required to essentially uh, uh, put a, uh, revitalize the long-term care facilities by putting air conditioning. This is not going to happen overnight. So we have to find those solutions. Are fans sufficient? Are they going to protect those people that are that are confined to their beds? 
Next slide. So alternative approaches that have been recommended, folks, that we see as well that are being recommended in some of these, both by the World Health Organization, by other health agencies, is limb immersion. These are very thought to be very simplistic ways because water is a greater conductor of heat. If you're sitting in, in a cool room, you know, people always say, all I have to do is go to a nice cool room. Yes, cooling will make you feel better. But folks, remember one thing. When you are extremely hot and you, you feel like you're, you're hyperthermic, it'll make you feel good, but it doesn't remove the heat from the body. Why? Because when you go from a hot room to a cool room, you're suppressing your heat loss responses. So all that heat stays within the body. It takes time for that, that, that heat to be extracted through natural processes. Immersing your limbs in cool water is thought to provide some greater level of extraction. So while going to a cool room is effective in mitigating a potential rise in core temperature, coming from a hot environment where you're hyperthermic or you're, you're experiencing heat-related illness, going into a cool room will give you temporary reprieve, but it gives people a false sense of security because they'll feel better and then suddenly they go back into the heat. They haven't lost all that internal heat in their body and then they'll become more stressed when they go back into cool. So we're looking at this uh, limb cooling, whether it's effective or not, at the uh, preliminary evidence shows it's not. And I would surmise that it has limited benefits if somebody is already heat stressed. All right, next slide. So one of the things that obviously that is important when we look at the effects of heat stress are medical conditions. There are changes in terms of our bodies that essentially affect how we thermoregulate. So diabetes, as an example, anybody that has diabetes has a reduced capacity to increase skin blood flow. Why is increasing skin blood flow so important? Well, if you think about it, increasing skin blood flow draws the heat from the inside to the skin and allows that heat to be transferred. As you sweat, then that heat is, helps to, uh, to, to cause the evaporation of the sweat, causes the cooling of the skin. If you're a person with diabetes, you may have reduced skin blood flow. So the air to skin temperature gradient is higher. You gain more heat from the environment. You have to sweat more, therefore, to get to, to balance out that heat that's gained. But as well, what we see in uh, women is that women that are, are going through menopause, they experience the, the experience, experience of, sorry, these changes that ultimately can impact their heat tolerance. They feel unwell when they're exposed to heat. Part of that obviously is what you see as this sudden flushing, this, this, this massive vasodilation of certain sections of the body that essentially create this feeling of being unwell because now you have more blood being pushed to the skin. Heart has to work a little harder, but you, now you've got the heat added onto that. So that makes people feel like essentially they're under stress. And so what we want to understand is, again, to what extent does the hot flashes affect somebody's tolerance to heat? That's important because now you have a, 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 a change in the regulation of skin blood flow, which is so fundamental, fundamentally important to your regulation. Next slide. So again, when we look at uh, uh, when we look at how skin blood flow regulate. Uh, is important to the regulation of heat loss. Like I said, it's important because it also protects you when you're exposed to heat. When you're exposed to heat, if, you're, if you have a higher skin blood flow, you're gonna gain less heat from, from the environment. Air to skin temperature gradient becomes smaller. So what we're doing, and we know that with aging, that you are losing about 5% of your capacity to lose heat. That's significant per decade and women have a 4% lower capacity than men. And the reason for that is that at the end organ, so we're talking about how the skin vasculature responds. And so if you've ever been in the heat, sometimes you see a bit of skin reddening, that's the skin vasculature, the vasculature is opening up, it's trying to shunt all this blood to the skin. That's your radiator, like your car radiator, trying to get rid of that heat. So if you can't increase it, why? And what we wanna understand is if individuals with diabetes have impaired skin blood flow, what are the mechanisms? Is it because of the drugs that they're taking? Is there ways in which we can reverse that? So we're looking at understanding those mechanisms. Next slide. Next 
this is a bit of the same one. I'm not sure that that's the same title. It should be there. But at the end of the day, the one thing that is so important is that when you are exposed to the heat, so some of you may have participated in our studies and maybe you're, you've gone to Cuba this past Christmas or you go south, uh, you know, maybe going to Florida. You may sit in the heat all day. And one of the things that we know is that many individuals collapse later in the day. And that makes sense. But one thing that is problematic is when you look at heat-related deaths, can you predict them earlier on? If you look at core temperature, I can tell you it is so difficult to determine that. But through our work with your team, we've been able to look at what's happening at the cell. The cell plays a critical role in, in making sure that the body, the organs function well. It's You have what's called you have janitors within your, your, your cells that are responsible for cleaning up all the garbage. The problem is when the body's under stress, the cells are under stress and they get so stressed that they don't function the same way. They don't clean out all the garbage. As a result of that, the cells don't work well. They send signals. If we can identify those early warning signs, imagine those people, those, those 619 people that were living alone and isolated. I can tell you a number of them were, some of these people were admitted early, or at least they, they were called for, uh, for first aid assistance, and they measured their core temperature, they measured their blood pressure, and they said, oh, you're okay. Based off of that, they said, just stay cool, just stay hydrated. And, and people that do go to the hospital and present themselves and they say they're heat stressed, they tend to send them home unless it's severe. So if we have a way in which to identify that at the cell level, there's an early warning sign and we can go and do a blood draw and figure out, ah, there's a marker that will tell us this person is at risk, then physicians can make an informed decision about whether or not to admit that patient. And that's important when you, you're trying to triage those that may be at risk. Next slide. So yeah, I think to finish off, the one thing I do have to say is your members, the National Association of Federal Retirees, have been so pivotal. As I said from the very start, already the work that we've done since well before COVID, and you were there with us through COVID-19, we've developed for the government of Canada and our partners at Health Canada, indoor temperature limits. That means we now know what are the upper limits that landlords should maintain, that long-term care facilities should maintain, that hospitals should maintain. Those guidelines are now being tabled at the World Health Organization. I sit on that committee with my partners at Health Canada who are leading the charge with, with WHO. We're also coming with guidance as to the use of cooling centers. How many of you know that cooling centers have been advocated? You saw what Emily showed on there. There's a shelter here, cooling shelter that's available. They're good. They're good. However, the problem is it's only a temporary reprieve. So when somebody comes back out into the heat, they're actually, we showed, at higher risk. It's not just good enough to be exposed for a brief amount of time in a cooling center. There has to be other mitigation for the most vulnerable. And of course, we're looking at fan use. We're looking at limb immersion. And we're looking at other strategies. And we, again, are hoping that you will, again, contribute to this work. And if you want to, as I said, one of the things that we do provide, and it's been a benefit to all members, is an assessment of your aerobic capacity. What does that mean? If you don't know what your aerobic capacity is, is if, you, if you're trying to figure out, you go out there and you exercise. Let's just say, for example, you and I go out and go for a little run along the canal. All right, you and me are running together and I'm, I'm running at the same speed as you and I just can't talk to you because I just out of steam. I just cannot get enough oxygen in me. I can't convert that oxygen to fuel that I need for muscle contraction. That means I'm not as fit as you. You're talking my ear off and I just want you to shut up so I can do my job. Well. What it tells us is just how capable are you of doing that work. The higher that level of fitness, the higher your capacity to lose heat as well. So fitness is a good indicator, but it's also a good indicator, goal standard for your overall health. So we do that assessment for you if you participate in our study, and we also do a heart check. That heart check reveals how your heart is functioning. It's a 12 EDCG. So if you've ever been to the Heart Institute or ever had your family physician do a heart assessment, it gives us an understanding of the electrical, uh, electrical, electrical conductivity of your heart. Is it beating normally? Is it functioning normally? And let me say that when you're under heat stress, that heart is so important in being able to pump that blood to all the skin vasculature. 
So at the end of the day, we provide that test if you ever decide to participate in any more of our trials. So I finish off with that and thank everybody for your attention. Merci beaucoup de votre attention. Hello, everybody. Again, Dave here. Um, considering the time, we probably have time for only one question. Uh, there are, if there are any questions that people still want answered, uh, the attendees' contact information, or at least the presenter's contact information, will be included in the follow-up email. So the first question we have, I guess, is what criteria were used to categorize a person's death as heat-related? Yeah, that's a good question. That's the biggest challenge that we have. And that's the same thing that the Ministry of, of, of Health or the uh, Ministry of Labor has when it comes to looking at occupational heat-related deaths. So the best way, obviously, is, is if you're treating a patient already and you can measure core temperature. If you can't, typically what they're going to look at is the underlying air, the air temperature at the time of death and look at other, uh, for example, liver enzymes and other other markers that may be a good indication. Do they have underlying health conditions? It is a big, it is a bit of a challenge to identify heat related deaths. That's why when the BC coroner were doing the post assessment, it took so long to go back and look at the history. What were the, what was the situation in that home? What were the, what was this individual's health condition? It's not as easy as simply going in there and measuring core temperature because if somebody's already passed away or been found in their home dead or deceased, it's a little more difficult. You have to look at the the trends, what was happening uh, in that home or the surrounding areas and temperatures and just perhaps just their activity levels. Good question. Next one. Okay, hey, one more question here. Uh, it actually wraps up with a couple of questions, but I can uh, answer them quickly. Do yeah. we research and learn from other countries on how they have handled heat in various ways? Um, yeah, and how they cope with it all their lives? It's an excellent question because again, when we look at what we're talking about with the World Health Organization, you've got to look at different countries are going to have different approaches in terms of their built environment in terms of what that indoor temperature should be. This is why we have, when we're talking about guidance that's, that's, that's generated within Canada, it's important because we live within an environment that's quite different than what you would see in Greece. In Greece, people can tolerate temperatures of 35 degrees Celsius. In fact, many of the homes and during the summertime will experience indoor temperatures of 35 degrees Celsius. That will be normal. So the mitigation strategies, however, are gonna be somewhat comparable. It's just that threshold will be different. Now there's different behaviors and approaches to that, but we wanna standardize that. So within Canada, one thing that we're also looking at is example, you know, people living out West versus those living in the Maritimes versus us living in Ottawa. How many of you know our warm, humid air masses are deadly? If you go and speak about that to a person living out West, they'll just laugh at you and say, ah, it's nice and cool over here. But believe me, when they get those extreme heat events, like what we saw with the Western heat dome, that's potentially fatal. You're a little more tolerant in here in Ottawa because in the summertime, by the end of the, by midpoint in the summer, you're already getting some adaptation. So different strategies have to, or strategies have to be tailored to the environment that people live in. Okay, one more question here. Are the maximum potential temperatures predicted province-wide in advance of weather margins? Weather Say that margins. again? Are the maximum potential temperatures predicted province-wide in advance of weather models? Yeah, I mean, there, there's the, the, the predicted temperatures and then the frequency of the extreme or the, the number of hot days that we're going to experience. And I'm talking about extreme hot days are, are certainly going to rise. Now, have there been good, mo I, I'm assuming you're talking about modeling strategies. And that's not my expertise, but I can tell you that based th there's, there is a group out in Western Canada that developed or at least did some of the modeling predictions of what we're going to see in Ontario. So I want to say one thing within the next couple of decades for all of you that love to go out south. OK, you're out in Cuba. You just picture it right now. You've got those nice sandy beaches. You've got those you've got those uh, beautiful uh, trees and tropical gardens. Well, folks, if things continue within the next few decades, you will not have to book a trip to Cuba. You will have the palm trees in the back of your house. You will have the nice warm sand, uh, warm, warm sun in the back, in the backyard, because we are going to have very similar tropical like weather, hot, humid in the next few decades, if things continue. That means that we're gonna be facing some very challenging times. And hey, we have one last question. Yep. Are neck cooling bands recommended? I like them, but the material is important. So are they recommended? 
Yeah, I, I would not recommend them. And there's a number of reasons for that. You know, putting a wet towel around the neck, we have to be careful about one thing, folks. And certainly I, I get what you're saying, because around the neck, the main vasculature, the large vessels perfusing the brain and certainly the, 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 the veins coming back from the bringing back the blood to the heart. The problem is you have to also remember around the neck, you have some important sensors that regulate blood pressure. So ultimately, manipulating or rapidly cooling around the neck can actually have an adverse effect in your ability to regulate blood pressure. So while effective in the short term, we have to be careful of when we apply that. And this is why we say people that we see that we see that in the workforce for industry. Industry is always using, you know, like uh, chairs with with, uh, you know, uh, uh, ability to cool the arms. You know, these are all little things that people think are going to be effective because guess what? The commercial says it's going to keep you cool. The problem is, is there's so there's no studies that have ever looked at the evidence. So actually studied it to know that is this going to protect the most vulnerable older adults? So we need to uh, to assess that. But I would always be extremely careful when applying these kind of strategies. Okay, thank you. And that's the questions. So thank you. Thank everybody for your participation in today's webinar. The Ottawa branch would like to thank Emily Tetzlath and Dr. Glenn Kenny for such an informative presentation. Remember to look for a follow-up email. It would include some contact information for our presenters, as well as instruction on how to access the recording of today's presentation. Remember that you can invite non-members to attend our webinars, to try us out as a guest, to register for upcoming webinars. Please visit the, the Ottawa branch website. We will make sure to include our website address in the follow-up email as well. Thank you, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Merci beaucoup et au revoir. Merci, bonne journée. Thank you.